All right, biology people, we are back. Our next lecture is on Kingdom Protista, also known as more really small things, uh, some of which suck. Uh, protists are single-celled entities, and uh, just like the viruses and the bacteria, they are small, but they can be mighty. Uh, they have links to disease, several of these. Lots don't, but there are some that do. We're gonna look at some of those today, some of those examples, and uh, we'll go through. All right, little things can put a big hurt on us when we don't give credit or respect the little things, and we're seeing that right now with some people's actions in this coronavirus. Anyway, I'll get rid of this, and we'll get going. All right, ooh, that's not cool. Anyway, so, again, same sort of setup. Your class note is going to be on the iPad here in the corner. You'll be always be able to see what slide I'm on in your notes that you'll get through the D2L site. And then I'll use the whiteboard for a variety of different um, you know, diagrams or little explanations or the etymology of words or whatever it happens to be. Whatever I can add that enhances this, I'll write it here. All right, so protists are unicellular, which means single-celled. Right? They have one single cell that makes them up. And the difference between them and bacteria is that protists are eukaryotic. Bacteria are prokaryotic. Now, eukaryotic is like you. You are eukaryotic, which means you have a nucleus. You have a bunch of different organelles inside of you, like vacuoles and ERs, you know, reference smoothie, ER, Golgi apparatuses, mitochondria, ribosomes, all that stuff. Remember, bacteria had hardly any of those. These guys have all of those things. And you can see in the background picture here, this is a paramecium. Um, a paramecium is a type of protist. And you can see all the little organelles that are in there of various types. Right? Again, even though it's single-celled, this thing is very large. If this was a protist, a bacteria would be like this. There's our bacteria, and there's our virus. So again, you can see that the size difference here, it's single-celled, it's a much larger cell than this one, and of course that's not even made of cells. So, we do remember the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. If you don't, go back to your notes. We wrote that down on the board, I remember, before we, uh, the week before we left, before the pandemic. Um, protists are like a junk drawer in your kitchen. They're all single cell, but there's a huge amount of diversity. Some act like fungi and, and they decompose dead and decaying things. Others are plant-like where they run photosynthesis and others are animal-like where they're active hunters and they go out and kill other protists or bacteria and eat them. So there's a whole lot of things. And that's why I kind of relate them to the junk drawer. In the kitchen, you have like the silverware drawer, you have the, uh, the dish towel drawer, and then the drawer with the saran wrap and the aluminum foil. And then there's that one drawer in everyone's kitchen where you'll find like a measuring tape, um, a bingo marker, a screwdriver, um, candles. Like it's just crazy stuff in there that the, one doesn't relate to the other it seems, but they're all just jammed into this one drawer. So th that's what protists are like in some ways. There's a huge amount of diversity there. The one protist can be act and, and behave very differently than another protist and their life cycles can be quite different as well. So hopefully we gain an appreciation of that as we go forward. But all of them are single-celled eukaryotes. Um, protists can be put into three different classes um, or categories, general groups, and those are animal-like, fungus-like, and plant-like, right? Animal-like are like us, they're heterotrophs, they go out and eat other things. Fungus-like, decomposers, they eat dead and decaying things and plant like means they run photosynthesis, gaining energy from the sun. So look at the animal-like protists first. We'll get rid of this. So animal-like protists, they have to ingest or eat things from the environment around them, just like we do, right? There's four different types. There are the zooflagellates, and we'll go a little bit into each group here. There are the amoebas, some places you'll see the amoebas called sarcodines. The ciliates, uh, our little guy in the background here, the paramecium, 
is a ciliate covered in cilia. We'll talk about that. And sporozoans, which are parasitic ones that live inside of a host. So, our zooflagellates. Zooflagellates are animal-like protists. And if we break down their name, zoo is animal. And flagellate, anything that is flagellate, means it has flagella. Right? A flagella is a little whip-like extension of the cell, right? So these things would have the main cell body and then one or maybe two or three flagella that propel it along. A sperm cell, if you draw a sperm cell, it has the nucleus here at the 23 chromosomes and a flagella that propels it along. So this is why it's called this. So it's an animal-like protist that has flagella, single-celled animal-like protist that has a flagella or multiple flagella. And it helps it propel it through water. It's for motion. And that's just kind of talking about it there. Many of these things, when they're released into waters, like the lakes of Ontario and rivers and streams, they can cause sickness if you ingest it. So you fall off your paddle board or your water skiing and you, you, know, you, you, you get knocked off and you're in the lake and you mistakenly take a mouthful of water. You can get these things. Not all the time. Lots of people don't, but you can. Um, here's an example of a zooflagellate that causes sickness. This is Trypanosoma gambiensis. Now this is the Trypanosoma right here. I'll point at it. This and this and this. And these things are not in Canada. These are found in Africa. And there's a fly down there called the tsetse fly. The tsetse fly carries these single-celled protists inside of it. When it bites you, they can transfer into you. And it causes a disease called African sleeping sickness. And what happens here is the person gets bitten by the tsetse fly. The trypanosoma, the protist, goes into their blood and it starts to break down blood cells and goes after the tissues of the body, right? The person goes into a coma-like state from which they can, some people never wake up out of, and so it seems like they go to sleep and then they eventually die, right? A more common one in Canada is Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia causes something called beaver fever because it is spread through the fecal matter poop of a beaver. And when you get beaver fever, you run a fever, you're often, you have diarrhea or you're throwing up, it just messes up your, your digestive system, the intestines, the stomach, and you run that fever as well. So if you go up to the cabin for the weekend, that Friday you're up there, you get a mouthful of water, these guys get inside of you and then they can make your weekend not so pleasurable, we'll just say. Spend more time in the bathroom than you do out on the lake. We'll get rid of this. All right. So, amoebas. Amoebas are known for their ever-changing shape. All right, so here's an amoeba here, right? And it just kind of lurches around its environment using pseudopods. Pseudopods are these extensions that you see. So the pseudopods, here's an amoeba here, it would just kind of reach out in this direction, so this would reach out like that, and it would drag itself along, right? And the pseudopods help move it around. They're, they also help it catch food, right? So let's say we had an amoeba here, and here's a bacterial cell. So our amoeba is this pink guy right here. The bacterial cell is gonna be this little green dot. Remember, protists are eukaryotic, much larger than bacterial cells. These are prokaryotic. These are eukaryotic, so. It senses that this bacteria has come into its environment, and what it will do is it will reach out with extensions of its cytoplasm and engulf around it like that 
And then what will happen is these two arms, right? These are the pseudopods here. So there's a pseudopod. Here's another pseudopod, these extensions. They'll combine like that. And then they've got this thing trapped inside of what's called a vesicle. So this containment unit is called a vesicle. And our bacterial cell is in there. And what they'll do is they'll flood that vesicle with hydrolytic enzymes. Lytic, if you remember, right? Hydrolytic enzymes will break down the bacteria. Lytic or lysis means to, to break down. Right? I found this old poster here of the space amoeba. They don't have eyes. It's just for fun. But the engulfing of food like this, where these pseudopods reach out and grab onto this thing and pull it in, it's called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis. So more etymology here. The ending here, the cis, is a process. Cyto is cell. Phago or phage. So if this was an E, this O here, it means to eat. So it's a process of the cell eating. And if you think about it, that cell recognizes this bacteria and it reaches out and grabs onto it. It just kind of, right, it eats it. So that's what this is called, phagocytosis. Now, the next group are the ciliates. The ciliates are very common around Ontario. Here's a ciliate here. Now, I don't know if you can see it on this YouTube video, but if you look at it on your computer or iPad screen at home, you'll see it looks like a whole bunch of hair-like projections are running around the outside of this thing. Those are cilia, right? So we saw a cell earlier that had flagella. Flagella are very large, and there'll be one, two, or three of them. A ciliated cell, so this is flagella, or flagellum if it's one, a ciliate like this has a whole bunch of hair-like projections. They're much smaller than flagella. So this, these little hair-like projections, these are cilia. All right? So that's the difference. These are much smaller, much more numerous. These are larger and there's a lot fewer of them on each cell. All right? So, they're covered in cilia. We just talked about it. The background is a ciliate. It's a paramecium. Here's a diagram of one here on your PowerPoint lecture here. And so the ciliate will have a pellicle, which is kind of like a rigid outer kind of coating to it. And you can see there's a nucleus. It has a contractile vacuole, um, an anal pore, food vacuoles, a gullet, which is like a mouth, right? So it has a whole bunch of extra parts that bacterial cells don't have. It's a eukaryote, right? And so this thing will swim through. Now, I actually studied these in university. And so what this thing will do, there's one paramecium. I'll just try to kind of draw a paramecium shape here. It swims around, and you'll see these trichocysts right here. They lie just under the surface. All the trichocysts are here lie just under the outer surface and what happens is when this thing recognizes either a bacterial cell a little bacterial cell or even another smaller paramecium there are paramecium out there that will eat other paramecium all right paramecia but and what happens is when this recognizes this is our bad guy here this is the big one this one's going to eat either this or this what happens is these trichocysts fire out little extensions and these extensions spear into these things and pull them in where it can be ingested right so the trichocytes are much like that character uh, scorpion from Mortal Kombat or I used to play my brother in that he was much better at it than I was too many buttons on those ones right that's PlayStation they had all those buttons but when he was scorpion right he kick the crap out of me and then all of a sudden he'd say get over here and he'd throw throw out this spear that would come through and then it will pull the organism in towards it right and he'd finish me off in Mortal Kombat same sort of idea here 
when these trichosis fire out and grab into this thing, it's going to pull it towards the gullet here, the mouth. So they fire out and this thing comes in like a tractor beam and it goes in here into the food vacuole. So you can see some cells right here that have been captured, some small bacterial cells it looks like in that picture. And they'll get broken down by digestive enzymes. So there are some paramecia there. These are very common. If you went and grabbed a, you know, a, a glass of lake water and looked at some drops of it underneath of the, you know, a microscope, you would see these things swimming around. Our next group are sporozoans. Sporozoans are called this because if you look at the word, sporozoan, this means they use spores at some point in their life cycle. We've got the zeo in there, which means animal, because we know it's an animal-like protist. So sporozoans use spores at some point in their life cycle. They are non-motile. Non-motile means they don't move on their own. They need other hosts to carry them and transmit them from one host to the next. Right? And they're parasitic. Right? Parasitic is one of those symbiotic, parasitism, sorry, is one of those symbiotic relationships where somebody wins, the parasite, and somebody loses, the host, right? So you can see here, our vector, the thing that carries the disease, is a mosquito. And that mosquito, when it bites to fill up its abdomen full of blood, it's injecting the parasite into the person, right? It's injecting the sporozoan, the protist. So here are single-celled protists getting injected into the person as a mosquito bites it to take blood from us, right? The protist, the sporozoan here, it's getting a place to live and it's going to get to reproduce. You, you get sick and could potentially die depending on what protist gets inside of you. Plasmodium vivax is an interesting example. Plasmodium vivax causes malaria. There's a couple of different plasmodium species that do this. But here we can see these little yellow circles. That's the protist. These larger red ones, these are red blood cells. These things, part of their life cycle is that they reproduce inside of your red blood cells. And much like a virus, once all the reproductive copies are made, they burst your red blood cells and they're released into your bloodstream to go infect more red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen, and we need oxygen to make energy. Our energy is called ATP. Red blood cells carry oxygen. So if these are getting destroyed, this is not getting carried, this is not getting made. And without ATP, well, we're energy beings. Without energy, you die. Malaria is deadly. It can kill people. It kills many people in poorer countries like Africa. Anyway, let's erase this. So here's how malaria is spread, this slide. And basically, we're going to start right here with the mosquito. It bites you. And these little things called sporozoids come into your bloodstream, and they migrate to the liver. They go to your liver. And inside of the liver cells they change into a different format called a merozoit. And the merozoites reproduce in number, they become very numerous, and they start to erupt from liver cells. So your liver's getting damaged, and the liver's a very important organ to you. Um, so we don't like that. Then the merozoites go into your red blood cells. And this is from the previous picture. We saw the red blood cells with all those little dots inside of it, and they were erupt erupting and releasing them. So the merozoites go into your red blood cell where they then reproduce even more. So a single merozoite can get in there and reproduce a whole bunch of gametocytes. And these gametocytes will enter, or they'll be formed inside of your red blood cells and they're drawn in by mosquitoes. That mosquito then takes it and the gametocytes will fuse together. Gametes are like sperm and egg. They'll fuse together and form more sporozoites. And when the mosquito bites the next person, the sporozoites are put into their bloodstream, and again, we'll pick it up here, they go to the liver and do that, right? Some of the merozoites here stay inside of their red blood cells, and they just replicate and replicate and replicate. And the more that they replicate, the more red blood cells erupt. And that's the thing before we were talking about 
their oxygen levels get depleted and energy levels get depleted to the point where you could die because these red blood cells are needed to carry the oxygen that we need. Uh, one last thing about malaria, which I find interesting. There is a tie into Canada here, even though we kind of think of this as a tropical disease or thing like that, right close to the equator where these insects are around year, year round. Malaria means sick air. So sick air, what does that have to do? This thing's transmitted by mosquito. Well, workers up in the Ottawa Valley when they were building the CPR, the CPR is a Canadian Pacific Railway, not the thing where you're pounding on someone's chest and breathing into them because their heart has stopped. The other CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway, they were building it through the Ottawa Valley. Valleys are lowlands, they're swamps. So there's a lot of swamps that they were working through. And the workers were dying of this illness. They didn't know what it was. Now swamps, they smell pretty bad, right? It's stagnant water. It's not flowing like a river. It's, you know, there's no current. It just sits there and things die in the water and they decompose and it can smell pretty bad. Also in stagnant, non-moving water, we find mosquitoes. Mosquitoes love to, is there an E in there? I'm not sure. Anyway, mosquitoes love to breed in still water. So if you have like a, a, a Mr. Turtle pool in your backyard and you leave it there, mosquitoes will breed in that. Or tire swings when it rains, water will gather in the tire and mosquitoes will breed in that. So in the swamps, these are great breeding grounds for mosquitoes. And of course, mosquitoes track you based on your CO2 output. So as you're breathing and you, you have to breathe, you breathe out CO2 and the mosquitoes can track that. They go like, oh, there's a whole bunch of CO2 over there. Well, these workers are building a railway system. They're carrying heavy wooden ties and rails that weigh hundreds of pounds. So they're working very hard. They're breathing really heavy, emitting lots of CO2. The mosquitoes would track the workers, bite them looking for their blood. And in doing so, they would put the protists inside of the workers and they would die of malaria. Now, back in the day when they first were discovering this, they didn't have microscopes. They didn't think that it could be a single cell, little tiny thing. They thought the workers were getting sick because of the air. It smelled really bad in some of these swamps. You know how sometimes you smell something bad and you can feel it in your stomach. It makes you want to throw up or, you know, makes you feel ill. That's what they believed it was. Something in the air was making people sick, but others weren't getting sick, right? So they weren't really sure. So when they named the disease, they gave it the name malaria which means sick air, even though the air isn't what's doing it, it's microscopic protists being carried in mosquitoes. We kept the name, um, I guess because all the textbooks and such are already written, but it's, it's a misnamed disease. Just thought I would it, you know, bring that up. All right. Our next thing are the fungus-like protists. They're heterotrophs as well. They eat other things, right? Just like the animal likes are heterotrophs. They've got to eat other stuff to get their energy. And most of these are decomposers. Fungi are decomposers. So dead and decaying stuff and their waste. That's what these things eat, right? Hmm. The iPad has stopped working. Oh, there it goes. So here you'll find different types of slime molds and cellular and acellular slime molds and water molds and well, they're not really that exciting. So we're gonna move on. Thank you, fungus-like protists. Now, plant-like protists. Plant-like protists run photosynthesis. I'm gonna use green because we're talking about plants. So if you're a plant-like protist, you run photosynthesis. This means you're an autotroph, a self-feeder, self-feeder. And you use light to make your energy-bearing compounds. Here we'll find euglenoids and algae in this group. The two differ in a couple of ways. Euglenoids have the ability to be heterotrophic. Algae have to be photosynthetic. So if you're a euglenoid, you run photosynthesis when you can, but if you don't have access to light, then you can still eat things around you. 
algae have to only be photosynthetic. Euglenoids have al uh, flagella. Some algae do, but not all. And euglenoids are free living, while algae tend to congregate in large colonies. Um, so you have all these single cell things living very, very close to each other. Whereas euglenoids tend to live a solitary life cycle. They swim around through ponds and stuff like that. So we look here. Here's a euglena here. It's a single cell. You can see the flagella coming out of the tail end of it here. This is an artist's conception of this picture. We can see the nucleus here. Chloroplasts which contain chlorophyll and give it that photosynthetic uh, ability. And this is, little red thing is called an eye spot. It allows it to sense light. It can't see per se like me and you and be able to make out things with great detail. It's kind of like uh, if you close your eyes and you turn the lights on and off. You can tell when the light is on and when it's off even with your eyes closed. That's what the eye spot is like. There are diatoms here as well. If you go to uh, the ocean, I, when I took marine ecology back home in, in Nova Scotia, we went out on huge catamarans and we took these things and looked at them underneath the microscope. Very, very cool things. These are found in ocean water, probably in lake water too, I would say no problem. Dinoflagellates are here. You can see the chlorophyll, the green part, all inside of there, right? And you can see the flagella here. Now, dinoflagellates, these algal protists can cause something called red tide. So I don't know how well this picture will come out on YouTube, but you can see the red rusty color in the water here. This is a picture taken off the coast of California. And what a red tide is, it's something that they take very seriously there. So what happens is you have mixing zones of water. The cold nutrient rich water comes down from the north past Canada into the States and it meets up with the tropical warm waters. And when you get nutrient rich water hitting nice warm water, it's a perfect breeding ground for these dinoflagellates, these protists, um, plant like protists. And they can form what's called a red tide, right? So what we would have here is millions and millions and millions and millions of these dinoflagellates, these algae, and they're just reproducing like crazy. Nutrient rich cold water mixing with very nice warm tropical water. And so they spread out and they kill things. And it's really, really bad for the fish and the wildlife that are here because they do several different things. One, they feed bacteria and the bacteria multiply like crazy to eat these things and the bacteria steal all the oxygen out of the water. And so fish have less oxygen which asphyxi asphyxiates or chokes them out and the fish die because the bacteria that are eating the dinoflagellates, they're eating up all the oxygen in the water. The second thing they do is they can kill fish by congregating and gathering in the gills as the fish are breathing through the water. These dinoflagellates, these algae, get stuck in the fish's gills and they keep the fish from breathing. The gills are like the lungs. So if your lungs got blocked up, you would die pretty quickly. Same thing with the gills of the fish. No oxygen, no energy. And another thing they do, certain species of these dinoflagellates, these algae, they produce neurotoxins. And what the neurotoxin does is it basically takes your brain and the connection it has to the rest of the body and it blocks it up. It doesn't let it happen. And so this causes death and paralysis and uh, not good, all right? So red tide is something we don't want. They deal with this in coastal communities in the States. We don't really get it a whole lot here in Canada because the water is just too cold. But in the States, areas like Florida deal with red tides quite often. We can see algae here. So here's an algal cell here, right? They live in colonies. They tend to, so you can see a whole bunch of them around it. Here's an algal bloom. So this is in Florida and you can see the algae are in the water here. I know you can see this one clearly in the video because there's a stark contrast between the nice, very light blue water of Florida and the very dark green algal bloom that's in here. And again, not a good place for wildlife. The beaches would probably be shut down here, right? And of course, I found this picture of this guy. I don't even know if that's really algae he's drinking, but look at how the algae has covered the surface of this pond in behind him. 
there'd probably be very little fish in this pond simply because the algae are forming a physical barrier that oxygen just can't cross between. So the algae are blocking the oxygen from the air from getting into the water. And that's it for protists, right? And of course, Peter Griffin's here. You know what grinds his gears? Being sick all weekend up at the lake and not feeling better until the morning you leave. You go and you get beaver fever, you're throwing up, you are got diarrhea all weekend, and then of course, Sunday afternoon when you're leaving, it's like, oh my God, I finally feel better, but it's time to go. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the lecture. Um, the next one will be on fungi, very short lecture, and uh, thank you for listening. Hope this helps. Bye-bye.